Hi guys, so today we have a book review. As you can see, I've got uh, this book here, Zen Poems. Uh, when I came back, I uh, wanted to have a read of one or two of the books on the shelf. Obviously, I've, I've not been back long, uh, and I won't be back long. I'll be back in Bangor very, very soon, actually. So I knew I wouldn't have much time. But I saw this on the shelf, and I thought, well, literally, I can read this in, in practically one setting. It's a, a little poetry book. And um, I really enjoyed a few of the poems in here. Now, this is, as I say, Zen poems. And um, I I didn't really like Zen poetry for quite a while, because... I thought it was something of nothing, you know, I thought, um, and that's kind of traditional of, a, of a, having a Western upbringing and then starting to get interested in something like Zen or, or Zen poetry or anything like that. You kind of just think it's something of nothing. It's not really anything. And um, I thought that about the haiku as well, like Basho and, and things like that. And um, you know, it's not really anything. It's nothing. It, it's a bit stupid. It's a bit hollow. It's a bit this. And um, and then I started to get a bit more kind of on board with it. You know, I thought, this is, this is something, this is interesting. And I've talked about that before. Um, but it really is something with, with the haiku or with Zen poetry that you have to experience it. You have to kind of get gain an experience of it and, and gain kind of some sense of the essence of it and the simplicity of it then becomes uh, beautiful and then becomes really, really a high art. And I've wrote a couple of pages down anyway that, that we can look at, but also I'll probably give you a taste of a, a couple of the other poems as well. Um, but what this book has done is it, it's segmented into the four seasons. So, of course, spring, summer, autumn, winter. And uh, the person who's com kind of compiled it has done it in a way that the poetry, of course, fits those seasons. So there's winter poetry for winter, etc. And it creates a kind of story, somewhat of a, a loose sort of story, in a sense, uh, with regards to the seasons. And it and it kind of gives you a um, a sense of, of looking at the seasons in a very simple way. That's, that's really what this book does, because it brings together that really short, sharp poetry uh, that is either directly haiku or, or sort of like that haiku style, very much in that Zen style, um, and, and gives you a piercing look at what that season represents. Um, and it, so it, it was a nice book to read. Now, of course, with poetry, I don't get on with all of it like most people don't, you know, and some poems in here, I think, oh, well, it, it's not that great. But then someone else might say, well, actually, that's really good. And then something I say that's uh, really good, they'll say, oh, I can't see it in that. Uh, and, and so I think that, you know, your own experiences bring to it um, a certain kind of sense of either positivity or negativity. And, and not really just that, but affinity with the piece. Um, so you might have an affinity with a piece that's very, very positive because your experience is a lot as a lot of aligned with what that piece is saying. But because someone else hasn't had that experience of yours, that piece might not mean the same to them. But because, of course, there's such an abundance of people in the world and abundance of people reading and writing poetry, uh, there's always something for everyone, you know. So um, I really, really enjoyed it. Uh, and there was some piece in here that really uh, caught my eye. Now, there was one on page 234 um, that really got me, that really grasped me straight away. Um, and, it, and it really is simple, but it, it made me laugh uh, a little bit. And it, and it kind of made me feel um, the kind of sense of the antithetical nature in it. So it says... In my medicine cabinet, the winter fly has died of old age. And um, it's kind of so funny because you've got the medicine cabinet there. And of course, the person who's wrote that poem has literally just opened the medicine cabinet, seen the fly there, and then, ah, wrote that down, you know, in a 
kind of them way, in a kind of way of getting the thought and then the immediacy of writing it down. And that level of Zen poetry does actually take you. It's surprising, I know, because to someone not really understanding of, of Zen in an experiential way, they might think, well, yeah, of course, that's quite easy to do. But it actually isn't easy to do to get to that level um, of just kind of emptiness and kind of there and then boom, write down. And, and that first thought, the immediacy of that first thought wrote down into the experience and into that po poetry, basically. Um, and in a sense, it is just a sentence. That's all it is. But the experience behind it gives it so much depth and weight, poetically, subjectively. And um, it really was interesting. And as I say, this, this antithetical nature of what's going on there, the medicine cabinet being obviously for healing and, and, and restoring life, but yet the fly has died of old age inside the medicine cabinet. It's, it's very, it's very good. I thought it was quite interesting. So you've got things like that in there. And you've also got longer poems in here, you know. Um, it says here, and now I don't know whether this one's going to be any good or anything, but we'll see. Uh, it says, no one believes that death is the end. If after a day's harvest he sees the sheaves shine and the grain smile as it pours into his hand. When I read that one, I thought, that's, you know, okay. I didn't say, for me personally, I didn't say, I wasn't like overwhelmed with that one or anything. But I think it's quite a nice little poem, actually. Um, and so, you know, that's that's not a particularly longer one. There's longer ones than that in here, but it's slightly longer than the other one. But most of the poems that you'll find in here, if you're interested in buying this book or reading it, are of that sort of length maybe a touch longer or maybe a touch shorter. Uh, and of course, there's a lot of uh, sort of haiku type ones in here. Uh, if not directly haiku, then very, very close to it. Like, for example, this one here, evening coming, the office girl unloosening her scarf like that. That's kind of a haiku type style. Now, I don't know whether it is five syllables, seven syllables, five syllables, um, I'm not certain actually. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna check. I can't be bothered checking. So, um, but there's that one there, and there's those that are, that are like that. Uh, and then there's this one here. Uh, this little house, no smaller than the world, world, nor I lonely, dwelling in all that is. Now that's quite a good one. That's quite a deep one, and I quite like that. But you see, sometimes with these poems, you can have too much esoteric nature in them. Now that one's not too bad, it's quite good, but you have a bit of, like, if you put too much of that kind of oneness or causal connectivity or or Buddha nature into the Zen poetry, it becomes a little bit, as some people would say, like stuffy Zen, you know. Um, but that one's not too bad, actually. It just gets the balance right. Um, but you can have ones where it just tips a bit too much, it's a bit too stuffy. So that's why I like the one with the medicine cabinet, because it's not Zen really, but it is Zen. You see, it's a it's a it's a hidden type type Zen in a sense. Um so that's why I like those. Um but there, as I say there's some that that I'm not too keen on in here. Um but there's still some quite nice ones and, and what also the author does is at the start of each kind of section, this is the start of the winter section, is he writes a little bit about winter, and it's actually a pretty um, nice, succinct understanding of really the feelings of what these seasons give us, and he does it quite well, actually. Well, I'll read a little bit of this out here. Winter reminds, of, reminds us of old age and death, but we still find a way to be playful. What fun, it may change into snow, the winter rain, he's quoting a poem there. Uh, in the heart of such deep stillness, we find the quivering seeds of the new season, and in our own hearts, the strength to trust in the constant flow of life. For, and then he quotes another poem, at the height of the storm, there is always a bird to reassure us, an unknown bird who sings before flying away. And that, now that's very... 
that's a that's a very prominent um thing that is and uh, so i do like it i think it's quite a nice little book so if you're interested i won't make i won't draw out this uh, video too much longer because uh, i've said quite a lot of what can be said about it really uh we've got a little poem on the back there as well and the the uh person who kind of i, I don't want to say wrote because he didn't really write this book but compiled it in the way they've compiled it they also included i do believe at least uh, a few of their poems in it as well um so that's quite nice um because it gives it a bit of connection to the author it's not just someone who's compiled the book they've actually put something in it of their own as well which i like um so it says on the back here this uh, little poem of summer grass along the path to the mountain temple stone images of buddha and then you know that's quite a nice one that's quite a quaint little one i quite like that it's, it's quite nice um and the beautiful thing with this poetry just to, to summarize is that you always get the images in your mind you know you 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 read the poem and you see that you know you see the summer grass and what i'm picturing there is is there's kind of like this path and it's kind of like one of those paths that uh you know almost like an leading to an aztec temple where where the stones are on the path are kind of broken almost like round stones but they're not perfectly round and, and they're all like broken a bit and stuff and then you've got this grass to the sides and maybe it's slightly long grass not really really long but just slightly longer grass and you're walking along and then what the image comes when you say uh stone images of buddha you see these uh moss covered uh images of uh you know these these stone statues now these are gray stone statues with little as i say with bits of moss over them and the moss is kind of turned into an algae type color it's not that really bright green moss but it's an algae type color of uh, a slightly yellowing or browning type moss and you see this this face of, of this Buddha there as well, and you also get a a, a feeling as well of those. Uh, is it Japanese or Chinese? I always forget the the stone statues that that uh, army of them. I always forget the name of that army of stone statues. Terracotta army, right? Is that that is that the right thing? Anyway, I, I get a little bit of that in there with with regards to the. Uh, facial features of, of this statue as well. I'm not only seeing Buddha statues when I'm reading that poem, but I'm also seeing those type features on these statues. And, and then, of course, we're seeing, uh, especially when we say mountain temple, you see this mountain and you see in the distance this temple. And it's a kind of, um, it's almost like a Sumerian type temple in a way. You, you get hints of that, or at least I do. And you've got these kind of spires coming up either side. It's almost like a temple that is in a grounds, and the grounds is almost a, a sort of mandala like uh, uh, area because it's a square area with these kind of shoots coming up, with these pillars coming up. And, uh, and then the temple is is within that, and it's got a nice big door on it and it's it, but it's very old and again it's covered in moss and and you get all of that all of that comes through in those three little lines and that is the beauty of some of this poetry because uh, it really gives you freedom to imagine what that is it's not telling you it's saying to you summer grass along the path to the mountain temple that can be whatever you want it to be in your imagination when you're reading it it doesn't have to be oh this little piddly mountain temple this poetry really gives you the, the freedom to imagine what that is whether that's consciously or whether that's more autonomously, as I've uh, as I've kind of explained there, the images that I got when reading that poem just then were autonomous, and I was simply explaining what my psyche produced uh, as a, as a kind of imagistic fantasy based on that poem. But you could also, of course, be be very much consciously absorbed in that process and and create kind of ideas of what that could be and create sort of uh more elaborate imagistic fantasies of, of what that can be and, and and so that's uh some as i say that's some of the beauty of that poetry but anyway i'm going to leave it there now guys thank you very much for watching and i will see you in the next video so see you very soon guys mm -hmm.